Hello and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we talk to experts about all things finance. If you get value out of this episode, please subscribe so you don't miss out on any in the future. I hope you enjoy. So thank you very much, Donna, for joining me today to talk about your new book, Trading at the Speed of Light, which is actually released in a week's time next Tuesday. Um, so I'd like to start by asking about what your motivation for writing the book was. Yeah, well, I suppose in some ways it was conventionally academic. What I am is a sociologist of science and technology. And for the last 20 years or so, what I've been doing is working on financial markets. And because the science and technology interest, um, I'm always looking at the more, as it were, technical side of markets. Um, then way back in, in around 2010, maybe 2009, Suddenly, high frequency trading, which had been a low profile activity until then, uh, got into the news. And I just thought, hey, that sounds interesting. I'd like to find out more uh, about uh, that. So that's really what got me started. Yeah, perfect. And you, you explain it very well in the book. But um, for the audience, what is high frequency trading? Because as you said, it's like a lot of people haven't heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's first of all, proprietary trading, that's to say, uh, you're not trying to earn money by executing trades on behalf of somebody else. Uh, you're trying to earn money directly through trading. So that's what proprietary trading is. Um, high frequency trading is proprietary trading where the profitability depends intrinsically on the speed of the trade. Now, that's not my definition. In fact, one, one of the people I spoke to who was a former high frequency trader uh, came up with that. And I, that strikes me as a nice definition. So proprietary, where profit depends on being fast. Yeah. And I think you, you sort of talk about the arms race that there was uh, throughout the book. And I, I found it quite interesting that, you know, there's the golden uh, sort of line, which is, I know it's mentioned in Flash Boys as well. And it expands to sort of microwaves, which becomes the fastest. So, yeah, you study technology. Do you think there's a is there a way for it to become faster than what it already is? Well, in terms of the communication links, um, you know, because in particular the gold line that you're referring to is between the futures markets in Chicago and the markets in northern New Jersey, um, which where markets here simply means the warehouses, the computer data centers um, that high frequency trading takes part, takes place in. Uh, so the ones in New Jersey are where um, shares and foreign exchange are traded. So the link between Chicago and New Jersey can't get that much faster than it currently is um, because since we all, I think, think that Einstein was right and the fastest any signal can ever travel is, travel is the speed of light in a vacuum, uh, they're not going to be able to get faster than that because yeah. at the moment the signals are going across the surface of the earth. Um, science fiction wise, you could build a tunnel through the earth and that would shave a few millionth of a second off. But other than that, Einstein's limit is now pretty close. So that's one of the reasons the arms race is so expensive, because they're at diminishing returns, spending more and more money to get smaller and smaller um, increments uh, in speed. So that's it's inherently limited in that way. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's what you've sort of shown that just a, I think it was hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds or dollars just to get those few extra nanoseconds that, you know, for them to make that much money. Yeah. Um, and, and you sort of talk about the history of the stock exchange, and I found that very interesting and in how it's sort of, it's been very resistant to change and especially at, at the CME. So wh why was that? Why did, didn't it want to sort of adopt the technology and then go to high-speed trading? Because those trading pits, you know, and one of the things I feel very lucky about is that earlier research had taken me to Chicago when, the trading pits were still fully flourishing. They were astonishing places because a big pit would have hundreds of traders crowded into it, making deals with 
hand signals and their voices shouting out bids or offers, hand signaling bids and, and offers, jostling each other, you know, occasional fish, fist fights, um, watching each other's bodies, looking for the little signs that indicate that somebody's scared, that they may have to trade. Uh, so it's an astonishing way of life and very, very demanding, physically demanding, as well as mentally demanding. And if you were at all good at it, this was a hugely important skill. And more than that, a hugely important part of your identity. You know, so you didn't want to move from that vivid, bodily, in-your-face environment to just sitting at a computer all day. So ele the ele electronification of futures trading um, wasn't simply a technical change. It was the end of a way of life. And that's why it was resisted so, so bitterly. Yeah, I think you said now that the, they're all quiet, all the, um, the pits, there's everyone's on computers and there's no one there at the yeah. moment yeah yeah yeah, so yeah. yeah. And that was even before coronavirus now, obviously coronavirus has speeded the process of the closing of the pits but um even before coronavirus um even way back in 2011 um the pits were quiet 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 yeah which is a massive change so yeah. one thing that's mentioned in the book as well is the notion of sort of the market maker and, and the liquidity, liquidity taker yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you explain a bit more about that and maybe how high frequency trading sort of takes advantage of, of that? Yeah, this is right at the center of the whole thing, right at the center of the story in the book. So what one's got to think about is that one of these electronic markets um, is at its core uh, an order book, an electronic file of the bids and offers uh, that have been placed but not yet cancelled or executed. To be a market maker means that you're constantly posting in that order book bids to buy and offers to sell with a little price difference because of course you're trying to trying to take you're trying to make money so that the offer to sell is always going to be priced at just a little bit higher than the, the bid to buy. And so it's now done electronically. That's a kind of translation of a traditional human role in markets. And people who are market makers um, take kind of comfort from that, so to speak. They take legitimacy from that. They can say to themselves, we are providing a service um, to investors who want to transact immediately. The taker, on the other hand, um, and again, this is, algorithmic these days, the algorithmic taker uh, tries to identify situations where it is profitable to execute against those orders that are already in the order book. And those these days, the, those will mostly be orders from market makers. So when something dramatic changes, and, and we're not talking mega dramatic, we're talking um, changes that can happen typically around once a minute, is that, kind, is that kind of frequency, suddenly there's an opportunity profitably to take. Um, the maker algorithms don't want to be uh, picked off as the parlance would be, so the maker algorithm is rushing to cancel the stale bids or offers, the out-of-date bids or offers, bids or offers before they're executed against. And the taker algorithm is rushing to execute against them uh, before they're cancelled. And that's the core speed race of high frequency trading. And those races are very common. Um, that uh, Matteo Aquilina, <laughs> of the Financial Conduct Authority with Peter O'Neill and the Chicago economist Eric Budish searched for traces of those speed races in messaging data from the London Stock Exchange. And they found one um, essentially on average 
once a minute for a typical stop in the FTSE 100 stop index. So those races are not at all rare. They're, they're happening all the time, let's say roughly, roughly every minute. And that's such an important shaping factor to the entire way in which high frequency, high frequency trading is configured uh, to why the activity is so expensive, why shaving nanoseconds, nanoseconds being billions of a second, why that has to happen. Yeah, definitely. I found that interesting that they can actually take advantage of an order that's been placed. And because they're so much faster, they can actually get to the, you know, they can get there faster and they can actually make the um, sort of, you know, do the order and take advantage of that. I think that's something that's mentioned in Flashboy as well, which I found, you know, amazing that it's just so much quicker. And I think that sort of links to my next question, which is an efficient market hypothesis. Yep. You know, it says that all existing publicly available information is already incorporated into the price. But does high frequency trading sort of break this hypothesis? Yes, it does. It does. Um, because... In the original formulation of the efficient market hypothesis, um, time delay was not really considered, uh, at least at the kind of levels of which we're talking now, you know, time delays in microseconds um, or nanoseconds. And for sure, uh, what you've got is pieces of publicly available information, because for example, a move in the prices of, of stock index futures in Chicago, um, that is publicly available information. There's not insider trading or front running going on here. It's mm -hmm. publicly available information, um, but you can still systematically profit if you can receive that publicly available information just a tiny fraction of a second before the next algorithm, the next person um, gets it. So at a certain level, yes, that is a violation um, of market efficiency, but it's also of course the case that competitive pressure squeezes the time difference involved. Another interesting aspect of the work of Eric Budish and colleagues, incidentally, though, is that um, the size of the prize isn't mm -hmm. shrinking, as you might expect in the efficient market hypothesis. You'd expect the sheer, the, the size of the prize to shrink, and it isn't actually shrinking in Budish's um, analysis, but the time scales that you have in order to capture the prize before it vanishes, those those are shrinking. Yeah, definitely. I think you mentioned that we're sort of seeing an economy as a scale, and there's coming to the point where it's sort of winner takes all. I think there was you mentioned there's two companies that is eighty percent or something of the um, that have a large majority of the sort of uh, liquidity throughout the, U the U.S. Is that correct? Or um, that that's um, slightly in excess of what I say. Okay, it's sorry. <laughs> But uh, what I'm quoting there is actually the Financial Times okay. suggesting that 40% of all U.S. share trading, so all U.S. share trading, this is not of high frequency trading in, in, in U.S. shares, is accounted for by just two firms, um, Citadel and Vertu. Now, I'm not completely confident that figure is right, um, but Gary Gensler, the new head of the SEC, um, made a speech a couple of weeks ago where he said that just two firms are transacting more business than any exchange with the exception of NASDAQ. Um, he, he too also didn't give the, the detail. Um, but yes, that's a pretty high degree of concentration. Yeah, definitely. So I was about double, <laughs> twice too, too much. Yeah, almost there. Um, so I, I found a really interesting part was you interviewed um, sort of someone about a specific part of their system and how it worked. And they said, and it's a, one of the titles of the chapters, they said, not only would I lose my job, I might lose my legs too. Yeah. So um, those are words you, uh, you know, you'd normally link to maybe mobsters, not the finance industry. So uh, <laughs> why is high frequency? It's sort of, even though you said it's had the, People know about it now, it's still quite shrouded in mystery. So why is that? Um, well, that particular thing is not shrouded in mystery any longer. I mean, that's now in the in the public in the public domain. It's 
what that indicates is that apparently very minor things because of the speed race phenomenon, apparently very minor things can have a major effect on the profitability um, of firms. So that if you believe that you are the only person or your firm is the only firm uh, that knows of a particular source of advantage, then of course you're going to want to protect that advantage. And um, it, it turned out, in fact, that um, this was a warning that uh, a trader had received um, from a manager who seemed to think that he or his firm knew something that other firms didn't know. He was wrong in that, in that instance. This was what more widely known in, in the industry. And that's actually an interesting thing that I increasingly found as I did the research, um, that people think of high frequency trading as being very secretive. And indeed, there are some firms that really discourage their staff from speaking to outsiders. But there's also a lot of common knowledge in mm. the business. Um, a lot of things that everybody knows. And that indeed is part of the speed race phenomenon because um, the fact that everybody understands that if, for example, a stock index future changes price, that a fraction of a second later, the underlying shares are most likely going to move in the same direction. The fact that everybody knows that, uh, yeah. it becomes a matter of speed. It's not cleverness um, any longer. It's not that you've detected some pattern in the markets that nobody else has discovered. You're dealing with a pattern that in effect everybody knows about and mm -hmm. you have to react as fast as you possibly can. Yeah, definitely. I think when it comes to the secretive parts, maybe when they take advantage of other people's algorithms or it's sort of that way you said the liquidity maker slash taker and if they sort of and i think there was a spoofing incident that you said that used to happen um which is where they you know that was quite common to sort of arbitrage and make an advantage yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no spoofing is actually a rather interesting topic in this context because uh is spoofing what spoofing is is to bid or to offer with the intention to cancel the bid or offer before it's executed. And the reason people do it is because the order book is so central uh, to electronic trading, the balance of bids and offers in the order book is a major signal, so to speak, that high frequency trading algorithms uh, act upon. So if you can change, strategically change the contents of the order book, by placing a big bid or a big offer, a big bid or a big offer, um, you can actually profit from predictable behavior uh, by algorithms. Um, it used to be in trading pits, people spoofed all the time, uh, yeah. but it's become illegal in today's world of high frequency trading. Yeah, well, I think um, a good example I remember is um, in, in Hounslow, there was the, um... The young, the young man, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, who uh, I think he, he caused a flash crash in 2010. Well, that, that's who they blamed him on because he was spoofing massive amounts. And yeah. Um, and yeah, but as you said, it's sort of, is it illegal or is it just very much frowned upon? No, it is. Um, it's, it, it is against the law, um, against the law in the United States, also against the law um, in the UK. Um, there have not, in fact, been that many criminal prosecutions for it. As far as I know, the only criminal prosecutions have taken place in the United States. And part of the reason for that is that proving intent, the law is framed about intent to cancel before execution. And that's quite a hard thing um, to do. But there's a lot of activity. It's by regulators and by exchanges these days is devoted to detecting and penalizing spoofing, even if uh, most cases don't actually end up in a, a criminal court. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, and another interesting part in the book you mentioned is how rain can affect sort of trading in the US, especially between New York and 
uh, the CME. So how is that possible? Because to get a signal over a long distance, say between Chicago and northern New Jersey, now of course what you can do is you can use fiber optic cables buried in the ground that may aren't affected by rain. But the trouble with those is that a light signal in the fiber optic cable is slowed by the refractive index of the glass that forms the core of the cable. So you're only at about two thirds of Einstein's postulated maximum signal speed. Mm. So what you want to do is to send your signal through the atmosphere rather than through a cable. Mm. And typically people do it by microwave radio uh, transmission. So in other words, you have two tall towers, um, something like 80 kilometers apart, and you'll be sending a radio signal from one tower to the next. And you have a, a relay system of towers between um, Chicago and, and New Jersey. You, you, have to, you, have to, you have to have the relay because the curvature of the earth stops you sending a microwave signal um, directly. Um, and everybody wants to be on the same route, mm. the same direct line, um, but microwave signals interfere with each other. So you can't always put up a microwave dish using the frequency of microwave transmission that you would like. So what people would like to do would be to use the lowest of the commercially available frequencies, which is um, six gigahertz, because that's not really not very much affected by rain, but there's too much crowding because everybody else is trying to do the same thing. So you've got to move up to 11 gigahertz, 18 gigahertz, 23 gigahertz. And the higher the frequency, the more likely it is that the signal will fail when it rains. So yes, there are noticeable effects, so I am told, on patterns of prices in New Jersey, according to whether it is raining between New Jersey and Chicago. Yeah, it's amazing the lengths of people that will go to just for that extra, you know, as you said, nanoseconds. But I guess that they make a lot of money from it. Um, so sort of another part that you mentioned in the book, and it's quite interesting, is that a lot of them, they say that high frequency trading is very is vital for the health of the markets. Um, is, is that something that you, that you believe, that it's a necessity? Yes, it's a very complicated question um, because it's a nuanced matter. Mm. I mean, first of all, what you've got to do is not have a rosy-eyed view of what the past was like, the pre-high frequency trading. Yeah. Market. Because, of course, the insiders within financial trading were able to make very healthy profits. Um, so, for example, in NASDAQ stocks, um, as late as the 1990s, the typical difference between the highest bid from a market maker and the lowest offer from a market maker would be 25 cents. Mm. It's very healthy from the market yeah. maker's viewpoint. These days, for most US stocks, uh, that difference has shrunk to a single cent, so fallen 25 fold. And indeed, that's not that recent. I mean, that was already in place by something like 2005, six, um, thereabout. Now, there are many factors involved in that, but absolutely the automation of trading is, is part of it. You can't really run a profitable human-based market-making business with spreads of a single cent. You have to do it in an automated um, kind of way. So that the automation of financial trading, of which high-frequency trading has been a vital part, um, that has absolutely brought spreads down and other things being equal, reduced spreads do benefit the end investor in financial markets, unless the end investor, of course, 
simply reacts to reduce strains by doing more and more trading, which is always a, a foolish uh, kind <laughs> of idea. So that effect is a beneficial um, kind of effect. Um, on the other hand, there are risks. There's the risk, of course, of an algorithm simply going wrong and causing massive, uh, massive disruption. That fortunately hasn't happened on any large scale very, very recently, but it's, it's always a risk. There's the arms race costs that I mentioned because ultimately those are borne by the end investors um, in financial <laughs> markets. And there's also the degree of concentration that's developing. And curiously, the degree of concentration uh, is probably to do in part with the technical systems of exchanges getting better, less random fluctuation in processing time. And that random fluctuation is a bad thing, but the absence of any random fluctuation means that the fastest person always, the fastest algorithm always wins. And that's also leading to concentration. So you mentioned Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys. I don't agree with Lewis's line that uh, high frequency traders are evildoers, um, <laughs> so to speak. I think they have brought benefits to the markets, but we do need to think about arms race costs, about the increased concentration and so on and, and get a rounded picture of high frequency trading. What is one message you would like people to sort of take away from the book? Is there one message? Yeah, um, it's a threefold message. Um, <laughs> so it's a slogan. It's um, the analytical framework of the book, which um, I've called material political economy. And I think, you know, though this is of course specific to high frequency trading, I think those are always important questions to ask about markets. First of all, material. Markets are material places. Material here, including human bodies, the pits were material places, even though there wasn't much technology in the pits, it was bodies. Nowadays, high frequency trading, it's microwave towers and computers and the like. And the materiality of trading is always important. Political, the second word, the second word. This is partly to do with, as it were, what you might call the small scale politics of exchanges. You know, are you going to tilt the playing field in favor of the market makers or not, because many exchanges do want to tilt the playing field in favor of the market makers. But it's not just those, as it were, small scale politics, also in the United States, the political system has played a part. Mm. Congress has played a part in the evolution of this area. And then finally, economy, where we got to think about the financial system as something that what, what should be, what the financial system should be doing is providing financial intermediation cheaply for the benefit of the, the wider economy. But it's not very good at doing it cheaply because intermediation, the money tends to stick in the hands of the intermediaries. And one of the benefits for me of, actually, of studying high frequency trading is precisely because it challenged previous forms of intermediation. And in doing that, it, it rendered visible how money was being, was, was being made. So that's the message of the book. Always think about the material, the political, and the economy, about where the money is ending up. Okay, perfect. I think that's a great message to leave it. Uh, leave it to you. Thank you, Anthony. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining. Um, if someone wanted to buy your book, where would the best place for them to go be? Um, well, I hate to mention the A word, but Amazon is always, um, is always handy. Uh, I personally um, tend to use Bookstore um, 
www.princetonuniversity.org. But of course, you can buy it directly from Princeton University Press itself. All right, perfect. Thank you very much for joining me today, Donald. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.